Okay, so um, yeah, so I, uh, yeah, uh, I'm gonna talk uh, about, uh, well, maybe not all of this, but uh, joint work with uh, a number of people. So I just wanted to put that up at the beginning. And if I, you know, say something as like CEF, I mean, me and Ellenberg and Farb. Um, so here's a question that uh, sort of will, is gonna drive uh, a lot of what I talk about. Uh, if you saw this mathematical conversations a couple weeks ago, the, the first bit may overlap, but uh, then I'm going to talk about quite different stuff. So uh, here's a very familiar or very classical, maybe, topological space. Say you have a manifold M, and you can look at the space of N points in your manifold that are all distinct. Okay, so you're looking at just tuples of N points in your manifold with the condition that no two coincide. So this is a nice open subset of your manifold because you just removed all these diagonals where two points come together. Um, and you know, if you're interested in topology at all, you should be interested in the topology of this space. And one thing we often mean by understanding the topology of a space is we think of understanding it's cohomology groups. OK. So first, I want to say that we should you know, be careful about what we mean by understanding this, right? When we're you know, taking our graduate courses, what do we mean by understanding some cohomology group? Well, we probably mean understanding what group it is. It's some abelian group. OK, and so I want to say, first of all, that that's not really a very satisfying answer in this case. The reason it's not so satisfying just to know what group this is is because this configuration space has like very inherent symmetries coming from the fact that when you've got n points in a manifold, you can permute or reorder them. OK, so you have this action of the permutation group on, well, just certainly on the product. It preserves this subset, and so it's acting on the cohomology here. And I think if you came and you said, OK, I understand you know, this cohomology group. I figured out what abelian group it is. And I said, oh, OK, like when you switch the first two points, does that change your cohomology classes? If you said, well, I don't know. I didn't really look at that. Then like, have you really understood uh, this, you know, the topology here? Um, so that's, well, I don't know. It's good news. It's setting the bar higher. Uh, the problem is that it may be too high. So if I meant here by cohomology, if I meant real or rational cohomology or something, then understanding a vector space with an action of Sn is something that is pretty doable, right? There are like textbooks and classes on representation theory where you can go and re you know, learn everything decomposes as a sum of your reducible representations. And you know, the answer is something you can hope to come up with. But you know, topologically, there's no reason to think that you should just work over the reals or rationals here. Like you're very likely interested also in torsion in the cohomology. So whenever I write cohomology or homology today, I always mean integrally. Okay, and so then that's just an abelian group, and the theory of abelian groups with an SN action is not really a theory. Right? Things don't split as a sum of uh, irreducibles. You can't really hope to classify the indecomposables or simples or anything like that. Or maybe you can, but there aren't any. You know, it's, uh, it's really not something that's manageable. Um, and so maybe we set the bar too high. Um, but fortunately, there's, you know, we should set the bar even higher. Because there's, a, there's more structure going on here than, than we've seen so far. So if you have, let's say, a lot of points, let me make it a capital N because that's a big number. Um, if you've got a lot of points in a manifold and you wanted to, let's say, forget all but the first two, OK? You can certainly do that, right? You had a billion, and then you just forget where all but two of them are. 
So that's a natural projection from this big, you know, m to the billion down to m squared. And this is going to, the map is sort of down on the spaces, but so it's up on the cohomology. And I claim that again, if you came to me and you said, hey, I found this cohomology class in configurations of a billion points. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Does it actually just come from the first two points and is completely insensitive to the other 999 million? You should probably look into that if you're hoping to say you understand the topology here. Okay? Or maybe an even simpler thing is you could map all the way down to conf 1 m, which amounts to, you know, you've got a bunch of points in your manifold. And you just pick the guy labeled 1, say, and then you just forget the others. And so the cohomology that's coming all the way from just one point in M, which of course now it doesn't have to be distinct because there's just one. So this is just M, right? And so these are the cohomology classes that are just paying attention to does this one point wander around this handle or that handle and things. And so really, if you want to understand or say you understand what's going on here, I think you also should want to understand which things in here come from just one point or maybe two points, et cetera. So you want to understand sort of all these maps together. And what's surprising, this was really fairly a, a big surprise to us. It, it, it's been a great sort of uh, stroke of luck, I guess, in my career, is that adding this additional structure turns out to make the situation much more manageable. Okay, So I'm basically going to talk all, to, all you know, the rest of the talk is going to be about this sort of structure that I've outlined here with some arrows on the board. Um, and so I just want to sort of record what structure that is. Uh, before I do that, I should say these arrows are a little off center. And that's because there's not just one map like this. There's really a bunch of maps, right? I said you can forget all but the first and second point, but you could also forget all but the eighth and ninth, the eighth and tenth points, right? So there's a bunch of different maps between these things. There's not just one. And so really the sort of combinatorics just of what these maps are um, is encoded by a category that I'll call fi. So it stands for the category of finite sets and injections. But you might as well, if you like, think of just the sets being 1 up to n. They're all isomorphic to one of those. Um, and then the objects that I'll talk about sort of all of today, by an fi module, what I mean is just a functor from finite sets and injections to abelian groups. Or maybe I'll say z modules to bring out the parallel you know, with modules. OK, and so functor here is not doing a whole lot. Uh, so what do I mean by a single fi module v? Well, what, you know, what is this data? So v is, well, first of all, for every finite set, I'm supposed to give you an abelian group. So it's for each n an abelian group. I'll call it vn. And then for the injections, I'm supposed to give you maps between them. right? So for each injection from, say, n elements into maybe say m elements, uh, I'm supposed to give you a homomorphism uh, from vn to vm. Right? And these should be compatible in the obvious way. OK? So, this looks like part of the structure I had here, right? I have sort of a bunch of abelian groups down at sort of near the beginning. I have v2, and I have v1, and I do have some maps from v1 to v2, since there's two injections from one into two points. And then I have sort of a lot of these. I've got sort of n choose 2, many of those. Um, 
And I just want to say also this NS SN action is built in, because after all, what are the injections from n elements to themselves, right? That's exactly the bijections. So this structure contains in it also these maps. Uh, so if you want, you can think of these not just as abelian groups, but as SN representations. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of whether you're thinking of this as sort of, you know, grouping it here or here. Okay, so. Uh, this is sort of just, the, there's no content here, it's just a, sort of a listing some algebraic properties. But um, what we saw over there is, uh, right, so one example is that the cohomology of, maybe I'll leave off the n because I'm thinking of all of them together, uh, is an Fi module. Um, another example, just for the less topologically minded people in the audience, um, let's say you're interested in a congruence subgroup, by which I mean you look at the matrices that are congruent to the identity mod some level. Okay, so just congruent to the identity mod L. This is some nice, interesting arithmetic group. Um, so again, here that's the homology, but sort of the homology here of this congruent subgroup uh, is an Fi module. And why is that? Well, you know, the fact that Sn acts on this, it's just acting by conjugation on GLn. Um, and then whenever you have, you know, you want to pick the first two coordinates, one and two, you can include a little GL2 into a GLn. Okay, so this is just recording not, you know, not all of the structure of this homology, but uh, you know, a little bit of it. The one thing I want to point out is again, we're working integrally here, so this, you know, you have a chance to see some torsion. If you can say something about this, so far I really haven't. I just said it has a tiny bit of structure. Um, so what are the kinds of questions that you might want to ask about something like this? So here are just a list of some questions that I think you should, I really should, questions you'd like to ask. Um, so the most basic one, maybe, is what I was saying before. You know, if you're interested in some cohomology here, you could ask, is it all pulled back from just two points? Or sorry, is it pulled back from two points? Or you could ask more generally, maybe all the cohomology for a billion points is actually just splits up as something coming from the first two, something coming from these two. Everything comes from just sets of two elements. So you could ask, sort of, is there some two such that uh, all the Vn are spanned by the images of these n choose 2 maps from Vn. OK. That's an interesting thing. I mean, I think knowing the answer to that question is certainly helpful. It doesn't tell you everything. It really only gives you an upper bound on Vn. After all, this being surjective, can't you know? It could be as small as you like. Uh, so I think a. Uh, I don't know. Try to keep this distinct. No, whatever. Uh, a sort of better question, if you can manage to answer it, is whether there's some level so that all the Vn can be sort of recovered from just knowing v5. Or maybe you should need to know the ones up to there. But the point is that if you know sort of the initial segment, that you should be able to recover the entire thing for all n just from knowing those. And again, this might or might not be true, but it would be quite powerful to know that all the cohomology not only comes from two points, but it's sort of built in some universal way from what's going on with two points. Um, 
and like spoilers, you know, these things do happen quite frequently uh, in the examples. Uh, yes, yeah, so I mean, so I can say exactly what I mean here. I mean that Vn is what you get if you do a push out over like subsets of size up to five of these Vt. So this just really means you take the direct sum over all the five element sets and then you amalgamate them when the, oh, the sets intersect. OK, so this is, you know, this is literally a finite amount of data, and this is a complete recipe for recovering it. You don't need to know whether or not there's some manifold, et cetera. Yeah, OK. Uh, between uh, these two, was, I guess, a special case of both. It's just whether you can get Vn from Vn minus 1, or oh, from all the both sides. So this one turns out to be equivalent to, uh, sorry, not equivalent to, sort of for n bigger than 5 or 6 or something like that, maybe 6, I don't care, uh, you can sort of vn can be recovered from vn minus 1 and vn minus 2. So if you can do that, you can go over Yeah, well, if you, yeah, because you just do it. Um, yeah, OK, that is. Uh, yeah, those are some structural questions. Here's something that's maybe even more natural than these, uh, is just I had all these maps on cohomology. Are they injective? So are these maps from small things to bigger things, are they all injective? Or you might ask, are they sort of eventually injective? Meaning maybe the first couple aren't, but after a while they are. OK. Um, and some others, you could ask if the dimensions, let's say we work over a field or something, uh, grow in a controlled way. If you're going to work over Q, you could then sort of reasonably ask about something like the space of invariance. So here, somehow, in, in practice, you wouldn't expect this to grow. But you could ask if the dimension of the space of invariance is bounded, or a little better, eventually constant. Um, I, don't, I think that might be all, all my questions I wanted to talk about right now. Um, yeah, let's leave it at that. Yeah? Is there a natural limit object to this? Uh, there, there's always a natural limit object, and then you know a question which you can answer as well as these, is how much of it are you forgetting when you pass to that limit object? Uh, so if you remind me, um, I can try to come back to this question about limit objects. Um, OK. So these are just questions. And a, a big part of the strength of this theory is that it turns out that they all sort of align quite nicely with this algebraic structure. So uh, if you have an Fi module, you can talk about what it means for it to be finitely generated. OK? And I mean, some people might say, well, it's an abelian category. We all know what it means to be finitely generated. Um, or we don't get to pick what it means. But anyway, let me just recall in that case what it means. Uh, it, it means there's you know, maybe different elements in different things, but there's some finite list of elements. Let me just imagine for a second that it's generated by two things. Uh, well, you could say such that sort of no submodule, you know, proper submodule contains them. Or just more basically, what this is meaning is, uh, maybe I'll call this D, you've got your guy in VD in here. And then this has a bunch of maps to Vn. And then you've got some other guy in some other Vm. In here, you have your V2. And this has a bunch of maps into here. And to say that these two elements generate means that, again, sort of uh, for all n, Vn is spanned by 
the images. Okay, so this should sound very much like question number one. The only difference is that question number one is sort of generated by things of bounded degree, but maybe there could be infinitely many of them. Okay, so that's not a big deal. So let me just sort of for today, I'm just going to make the like simplifying assumption that all the Vn, like the each Vn, I should say, is finitely generated as an abelian group. Okay, and in that case, under that assumption, then this question number one is exactly equivalent to v being finitely generated. Okay. So that's pretty close to the definition. Something that's not obvious, and actually I thought this was a hard theorem of me, but it turns out to be easier. And like, well, somebody else showed that it, it's much more direct, Lee, Gan and Lee. Uh, but that this condition about being able to be recovered in finite by your initial segment is the same as being fi uh, finitely presented. And what you should think is that, well, this happening, knowing that only needing to know the first five is enough to recover, it means that whatever relations there are are showing up already in the first five. OK. Um, this is not so deep. This is sort of just a tautology. But this injectivity uh, is what you'd mean if you wanted to talk about tor being torsion free or sort of eventually torsion free. OK, so already that's kind of nice in that it says, hey, a lot of these questions that we wanted to ask are, oh, well, too bad, um, equivalent to these basic properties, like natural algebraic property. Uh, there's two problems with that. Um, uh, well, so, so, so you have a couple tensor products. Uh, and I, th I think for the right one, it probably is the same. Um, I mean, it's, it's not going to be actually flat, because these can have like two torsion. Yeah. But as you know, sort of the, yeah, uh, that aside, which you can set aside. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh huh. So, right. So, uh, what I wanted to say is there is sort of there's two problems. Problem one is uh, that it's sort of hard to relate uh, these sort of algebraic properties to each other. So let me give an example. Um, maybe before I get to that, sorry, I'd like to give one or two very simple examples of FI modules just to be very clear about the kinds of things we're looking at. So this is one of the sort of simplest FI modules you could have. So it's just you have your finite set, you take the free abelian group on it. OK, Sn has this natural permutation action on z to the n, and the injections give you the obvious maps. OK, so that's sort of very nice. Or something else that's sort of similarly nice might be you can take like pairs of elements. So this is some representation like that, or, you know, I don't know. Uh, something similar is you might take two element sets, uh, like the and g is 2. And these, I want to say, are like really nice. These really correspond to like free modules. OK? They're, I mean, they're just, you, you've got, they're free on these natural combinatorial generators. Uh, so what I say about it's hard to relate these properties to each other, um, let's say you define, like, B inside of this U I, I had to be the submodule generated by the element sort of E1 plus E2 
in z squared, just the sum of the coordinates. OK, so you could say sort of more concretely, you know, bn here. When I say generated, again, remember, there's lots of injections. So this is really going to be the span of e, sorry, ei plus ej inside z to the n. OK? So this is something which is very obviously finitely generated because it's generated by definition by this one element. Uh, but here's a question that's not so obvious. What are the sort of relations among these elements? And in particular, are those relations, can you write down some finite list of relations? Well, first, maybe can you write down any relation? So the first relation that you see shows up sort of in degree 4, where you see that e1 plus e2 plus e3 plus e4 is equal to e1 plus e3 plus e2 plus e4. If you like, this is sort of corresponding to this Young diagram, but whatever. So this relation shows up in degree 4, and then well, if you try to understand what's going on in degree 5 or 6 or 100 as an S100 representation, it's really not something that's very manageable. Um, and in particular, it's really not obvious whether or not all the relations are generated by this one. Okay, So I, I'm not going to answer this. That's why it's listed as problem, not like theorem. Um, and problem 2 which is maybe worse, is it's sort of hard to, maybe let's just say, understand the actual SN reps or even the actual abelian groups Vn. And so an example here is, Here's a really nice uh, Fi module. Let's say it's generated by, just like above, whenever you have a two element set, you're generated by those generators, and you just have a single sort of relation or a single class of relations like this, that when you have three, they sum up to zero. Okay? Algebraically, that's incredibly nice. I think it'd be pretty nice if you told me, hey, the cohomology of this space, it's got a generator for every pair of things. Maybe one is going around the other. And then the only relation between them is that you know, you, they're all generated by these triples. But uh, here's an unfortunately difficult question. Is this abelian group equal to 0? That's really surprisingly hard to answer. Okay? Or for example, you know, is it uh, free abelian? And so I can just show you the first couple of this just to convey to some degree why this is difficult. Uh, so the first ones are 0. In degree 2, there's one generator and no relation. So that one we know is z. The next one, we have three generators, but we quotiented their sum, so we get a z squared. The next one, we get, more surprisingly, z squared <laughs> cross z mod 2. And then in degree 5, the S5 representation we get is z mod 2 to the fourth cross z mod 3. OK, so like, and this took me actually maybe an embarrassingly long time, but it took a surprising amount of time to actually work out what this is. And in particular, like, is the next one 0? I, I don't know. It's, it's not easy to see. Or are the maps injective? Apparently, the maps are not always injective. This one can't be. But are they eventually injective? So OK. So perfect. So what I want to talk about sort of for the rest of the time is the ways in which you can solve these problems. Okay. And sort of the solutions at this point have sort of come in three stages. 
Um, so the solutions to these problems uh, sort of existential always sounds so overblown, but I think that's the right word. Existential. Uh, and then computational. And finally, something more sort of universal. Uh, so first, what do I mean by existential? Well, it turns out that, I guess I can say it this way, that fi is Noetherian. So maybe I'm not supposed to say that. fi is not really a ring. Well, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that if you have some finitely generated uh, fi module, then any submodule of it is also finitely generated. OK, that's what it means for a ring to be Noetherian. OK, so that has some immediate corollaries. So one is that finite generation is equivalent to finite presentation, right? So you know, obviously the 5 will be bigger than the 2, but these things turn, the existence of this turns out to be equivalent. Also, this always implies that you're eventually torsion-free just because the torsion submodule is a submodule, so it's finitely generated, and it's torsion, so it can only have finite length. So it has to vanish after some time. Uh, and it turns out that given this thing, uh, finite generation also implies these things up here that I wrote with 4 and 5. Maybe I'll just write it up here. So not only if you're finitely generated do you grow sort of like a polynomial, it's actually exactly a polynomial for big N. So you can think of some Hilbert series type uh, thing here. Uh, and not only that, but in fact, that's true even at the level of the characters. So you have this sequence of characters are given by a polynomial in the cycle counting functions. Again, exactly for n large enough. Um, this Sorry, this polynomial? Yes. So if you look at the dimension of Vn modulo p. Oh. Uh, I'm pretty, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to try to say anything here. I'm pretty sure that that has to be the case. Uh, I haven't, I don't know. It's not in my head fully, but I think that must be. Um, here, I really want to say q. Uh, so this, um, again, this is eventually constant. And you can do the same thing with the sort of multiplicities. Sorry, what if I, you mean if I did this? Second example. Yeah. So, uh, well, I haven't said yet that this is finally presented or something, but it is. Uh, so here, you may not like the bound. Uh, well, I mean, you need to know something about your particular situation. So I mean, in this case, like it's, it's, a, it's not an easy theorem, but it's a theorem that we now know is that this is finitely presented. And I can even tell you sort of in degree somewhere less than this. So that says, for example, the rank of this HK, or you can do like the dimension over FP or something, uh, is polynomial, like grows polynomially. In N. 
for fixed K. Well, in, yeah, in the Q, in the Q case, yeah, in the, in the Q case, Borel's theory. No, no, this is. Uh, I mean, this is really only really interesting integrally because of Borel's theorem. Uh, but it does let you get something like Borel's theorem. So, let's say you take just this, take L to be prime or something, and you take this like completed cohomology, mod L cohomology, and you complete as the level increases. You get the same theorem here. It's still finitely presented. And so you still get the same kind of polynomial growth. And so uh, Caligari Emerton used that. Now that you've completed, you also have a GLN Q, QP action. And this is a very sort of slow kind of growth that they show is inconsistent. Yeah, I mean, we use uh, sort of the classical algebraic topology, you know, van der Kolle and Charney, people like that. Um, which, but, but the point is that what you can conclude is that you do have the same triviality. Only the trivial representation sort of contributes uh, in small degrees, but not at all via Borel. Uh, sorry, let me try to say something more accessible. Um, yeah, so maybe I just say everything. Um, meaning, you know, it doesn't tell you about how large these things are. This is why I'm saying existential. You know, this kind of Noetherian result is very much like a Hilbert basis kind of argument. And so you really can't get anything explicit from it. You can't possibly know you know, how big the relations are in complete generality. Um, but stage two. Uh, I think there's a question. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so to, to confirm, does, does, that, does, does that mean that the, like, if there exists five, five such that all Vn can be recovered from V naught for D5, and there exists two such that can be recovered from? That direction certainly just, I mean, you could take the two to B5, if you know what I mean. Because, Right, this part is saying that you know this is some <laughs> direct sum over the things of size five modulo some stuff, and so this is exactly the things that you would hit by all the maps from V five. So two is saying not only are you spanned by this, but saying that the only relations that show up between them are like things you've already seen. Uh, yeah, so I was, uh, that's, I guess, what I'm going to get to here. Uh, well, uh, yeah, just if I don't answer that here, just uh, ask me again. Um, yeah, let me not, uh, Avi, let me not really say much, but just the sort of the question, the answer here to what you recover from the limit object, you can understand this in terms of the sort of local cohomology. Um, thinking of Fi is having this natural maximal ideal. Um, so the computational thing, if I have a chance, I'll, I'll come back to and, and really explain. But it turns out there's really a nice notion of Grobner bases in this context. And so I should say this is mostly due to Sam and Snowden. Uh, maybe Putman. And what this means is sort of not only do you have these Noetherian theorems, but you know, what Grobner bases do is they're sort of the witnesses for the Hilbert, ba uh, the, is it Hilbert basis theorem? That's the name. Uh, right? They're elements whose leading terms generate the leading terms of everything in your ideal. And so then you can computationally work with ideals. And so for example, uh, John Wiltshire Gordon actually has a computer program on his website. It's some like applet or something where if you want to type in, OK, I want to be inside z to the n generated by ei, and I look at just the things generated by e1 plus e2, 
it'll actually spit out for you a finite list of relations that generates all the relations. And so you can actually implement these things in practice. Um, so maybe I'll come back to that or not. Um, and then this universal thing, what I mean by that is answering the question of how long are you going to have to let your computer program run here? So this is something sort of, I guess, the most recent part of this. Uh, so one thing that you can see is If you know concretely where something is generated and sort of has the relations, then you can say, you know it's eventually injective, but you can say exactly where it's injective. It's injective exactly above k plus d. OK, so for example, in this case, we were generated in degree 2 by this. We had this relation in degree 3. And so this tells us that this map, I don't know what C6 is, but whatever this map is, is automatically going to be injective. And I say universal just because somehow you, know, you have to do this without knowing anything about V. And this is not really homological algebra. You use homological to reduce it. And then it ends up being a lot of sort of combinatorially flavored representation theory. Maybe I'm enlarging that term, but yeah. And, and the other thing, and this gets to your question, um, is, let me say it this way. Uh, if you have something that's, uh, sorry, that, that was supposed to be D. If you know that something is generated in a certain degree, and let's say it can be embedded into something free, generated in some other degree, then that implies that your thing is actually presented in degree uh, d plus k plus 1. So in this case, this was something generated in degree 2 inside of something just z to the n, which is in generated in degree 1. And so this theorem guarantees that whatever the relations are, they're always going to be supported just on four element sets. And again, you know, it's hard to sort of know what the relations are because I don't know what the <coughs> fi modules in question are. But you have these universal bounds there. Um, and I was just going to say, you know, this is something really sort of quite nice homologically. Like, if you want to know about relations between the relations, it only goes up by one each time. So, nothing here has finite projective dimension, unless it's projective, essentially. Um, so, you know, not, there's no cohomological dimension, but you do get a bound on like the regularity. Uh, which is, I think, a nice substitute. Could you repeat what you mean by free? Then? So uh, free, uh, if you like, I can just mean, uh, well, th th this was my example. Um, but can you start with any representation of SN and then freely generate Yeah, so, so I, I was trying to be vague here. The point is you could decide that's allowed or not allowed, and either decision is fine and the theorem is true in either case. Yeah, so free is not a word that has a natural, like an inherent meaning in an abelian category. Right. Yeah. But so, so you can make the, the, the more expansive choice here. Um, yeah. OK. So let me, in the rest of the time, pivot away from FI modules and try to talk a little bit about uh, where this has been applied, in, even in representation theory, and really where these ideas have been applied. Um,
so uh, one place where you can hope to get a little better than just, oh, I have some finite group and some acting on some abelian group is if you have something that has, you know, this sort of nice and algebraic, and when it acts in its defining characteristic, it has, the representation theory has some nicer structure. Um, so people who studied this uh, made the following definition a long time ago. Uh, so they didn't make this definition, but I'm just going to write it. Um, Uh, so V here is for vector spaces. So I just want to consider the category of finite dimensional FQ vector spaces and all linear maps, the usual familiar category. And then the definition that they made is that they say a generic representation Uh, is a functor, maybe I say w, from this category to itself. So the examples are mostly sort of familiar things. For example, you could take a vector space to some tensor power of it, right? This is sort of famously functorial. Or you could do something more you know, complicated, like you could look at sim2. Uh, you could take like a Frobenius twist. Okay. The reason these are called generic representations, by the way, is because this is something where you've got the group GLNFQ acting on something. But actually, right, GLNFQ sits inside n by n matrices. And these are the sorts of things that extend to this ambient, you know, sort of to all matrices. OK, and then that, that's people think, talk about these as being generic. Um, and oh, that's the microphone. Uh, like, I just want to mention the structure, even for these very simple representations, has a lot to do with the characteristic. For example, like, this sim2 one that I talked about is usually irreducible unless you're in characteristic 2, in which case you have this subrep just coming from squaring an element, which is usually not a linear transformation, but happens to be in characteristic 2. So what I mean by U here is, U, I mean, U is the blank in sim2 of blank. So, so it's, a, it's a functor, but you're calling it a representation. Yeah. I, I could give each of these a name, and then I'm saying there's a map from this functor to this functor. But I was only going to do this much with it. So, But yeah. Um, the point is that somehow generic representations, like it's, it's quite a strong condition to extend over every linear map. So they all kind of do end up being at least things built out of familiar algebraic representations. Um, so uh, people did a lot with this, uh, I think mostly in the 90s. Wow. But there was sort of a, a basic question that was left open, which was whether these things have nice uh, projective resolutions. And so if you're willing to let me abuse some notation, I think this was from 94, and the conjecture is basically that generic representations are Noetherian, meaning like a sub rep of finitely generated is always finitely generated. 
And so this was, I, I mean, I, I, it's not that it was like the central conjecture, but it's a basic property of them. Uh, for GLN, you mean? I, I mean, it, it's not really even GLN, right? It's really like endomorphisms. Uh, I don't know if people did this for like vector spaces with a. Sorry, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, with this definition. Yeah. So finitely generated, uh, the same thing. It means there's some vector sort of in some vector space, so that they're all generated by them. So for example. This guy, if I want to be very, very lazy, is certainly sort of generated by things like E1 tensor E1 tensor E1, E1 tensor E1 tensor E2, and E1 tensor E2 tensor E3. Being incredibly lazy, those certainly will generate any you know, tensor of any vector space. Now, I could, certain, I could actually eliminate probably all of them, but the first one uh, except maybe in some characteristics. But uh, all the things that you can think of sort of are going to be finitely generated, which is why it would be unfortunate if your submodules weren't finitely generated, because that would mean they were something you couldn't think of. Um, anyway, so this was uh, proved, uh, what, two years ago now. Uh, so this was uh, Putman, Sam. And Snowden, uh, well, uh, like, yes. But I think even the way that they proved it uh, is, is really quite, quite, quite nice. So one thing that they did, so you have this V FQ. There's a natural notion of like VI, where instead of all linear maps, you just take the inclusions. So this is a much more relaxed notion. It's much easier to build representations of that. Um, but what they proved is, first of all, that maybe I'll say first they proved that VI is Noetherian. And then they observed or proved it's not hard that this map is finite. Finite in the sense of a finite map of rings, which means that a module over this is finitely generated if and only if that's true when you restrict, you forget, you don't use most of the maps, you only use the injective ones. Okay, and so, uh, right, so this map is finite. And so that means then together, these, this means that uh, V is Noetherian. And so the general methods that they introduced, this is a simplification, but to do this kind of thing are, are being used a lot I mean, for other things. But proving it this way has two, I think, really surprising consequences. So the first consequence of their proof, right? this Land Schwartz conjecture, Everything about this, when I ask if a GLN FQ representation ex on something extends, sorry, U is a bad name there, but uh, extends to n by n matrices over FQ, this thing had better be in characteristic Q because the identity and its multiples right, are going to act on it. That's roughly true. Uh, OK, maybe that's a little misleading. Uh, but the, the, the point is just that this was all really about representations in the defining characteristic. And just by virtue of the way that they prove this, what Putman, Sam, and Snowden do is that they actually prove, so the conjecture was that these are Noetherian, what they actually prove is that these mapping to any abelian group are Noetherian. And this is something that was sort of, there would be no reason to ask that from the perspective of generic representation theory, because you know who even cares about generic representations to like free abelian groups? Uh, but uh, you sort of, it falls out for free. And the other thing that sort of falls out of their proof is that you don't really have to take FQ here. 
you can take here for any finite ring R. And so really, this is something, this is about some sort of asymptotic representation theory for any finite groups, GLN R. It's not about GLN FQ. It's not about being over a field. It's not about being in the defining characteristic. It's something more basic and combinatorial about just the structure of matrices and how they can interact. And I, I just think this is nice because it's, uh, I think, something that you only would have gotten sort of approaching this, this, uh, this question sort of from this avenue. So yeah, thank you.